that. Um, if one of your New Year's resolutions is to get more involved at church uh, through reading or um, ushering or participating in worship in some way, uh, please let me or Pastor John know. Uh, we are always looking for more people to serve. Um, so consider that and uh, let, let one of us know and let us know what, what it is that you would like to do. So, uh, John Langford, I think, has an announcement. Turn that mic on. Okay. Just a little um, announcement. Uh, we will be bowling tonight if anybody would like to join us. We didn't bowl last week. They were closed. So if you haven't been or if you're one of the regulars, we'd love to see you about 5 o'clock this afternoon at Beach Bowl in Ogden. Thank you. Well, we are here to worship this morning, so let us take just a moment and prepare ourselves for worship. Now join me, if you will, in the call to worship. Sing praises to God for all the marvelous things. Let us call upon God's name, proclaiming the power of God. We have heard of the birth of the Christ child. Thank you, Lord, for our hope and our joy. Now please rise as you are able for the processional hymns. Okay. Would you pray with me, please? Spirit of our living God, fall afresh on us all here today. As we look to the past 
and look to the future. Help us to be reminded that it is with you here in this present moment that we will find the most comfort, healing, love, and peace. Be with us now so that we can be opened up to your Holy Spirit and be healed and loved and comforted in all of this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is a reading from the prophet Isaiah. I will tell of the kindness of the Lord, the deeds for which the Lord is to be praised, according to all the Lord has done to us, for us. Yes, the many good things having been done for Israel, according to the Lord's compassion and many kindnesses. The Lord said, Surely they are my people, children who will be true to me, and so I will become their Savior. In all their distress, the Lord too was distressed, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. This is the word of God. Thank Thanks be to God. God. rise as you are able for a reading of the Holy Gospel. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Come, Holy Spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, o God. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so it was fulfilled that the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Maggi. He was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Maggi. Uh, then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. This is the gospel of hope. Praise, Praise to you, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit.
Amen. Thank you. Beautiful song. <clears throat> and would you, would you pray with me, please? Holy and loving God, what an honor it is to come into this holy place again this morning and to be in your presence once more. We ask for your blessing upon us this day, that you continue to shower out your goodness and grace upon each and every one of us and all of those whom we love. We also ask for the blessing of knowing your will for us in our lives. So speak to us now, dear Lord, into our hearts, minds, and souls. In Christ's name we pray, amen, amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. good morning. I certainly hope this past week has been enjoyable for everyone. Since the last time we have met together here was last Sunday, of course, Christmas Eve, and then Christmas Day, of course, on Monday. I hope everyone had a nice day. Now on this Sunday, it's New Year's Eve. This whole week of celebrations that we had this past week, which actually, remember, lasts one more week, 
until next Sunday when we celebrate Epiphany, which then closes out the Christmas season. Remembering, of course, that the 12 days of Christmas actually happen after Christmas and not before, from Christmas to Epiphany. I saw online this week, I'll tell you, a, a great little meme, you know, those little photos with captions on them, <clears throat> and it was a photo of one of the Downton Abbey characters. Anyone watch Downton Abbey? Uh, um, I think, believe it was the Lady Mary Crawley. And the caption read, The tree stays up until Epiphany. You will get used to how things are done here properly. <laughs> I thought that was cute. Anyway, what I want to highlight this morning is that while we have had this whole one-week period now between Christmas and New Year's to celebrate, there were other celebrations that occurred this past week on, on the church calendar. And they are quite different from the parties and dinners and joyful celebrations that hopefully are Christmas and New Year's. Every year on December 26th, the day right after Christmas, is the Feast of St. Stephen, the first martyr of the church. If you remember Stephen's story from the book of Acts, some of the early followers of the Christian movement began to complain to the disciples that they thought they were being overlooked. Because as the number of followers kept growing, it was becoming increasingly more difficult for those original 12 or so disciples to look after everybody. So they selected seven people to become the first deacons, and, and Stephen was one of them. And it turned out he was a pretty good preacher as well. In fact, so good that the, uh, the authorities arrested him, put him on trial, and condemned him to death for being so good at spreading the news of Jesus Christ. And they killed him. And we remember Stephen on December 26th, one day after the joy of Christmas, we're asked to remember the stoning and murder of Stephen. Well, the next feast day that occurred last week happens on December 27th, the very next day, which is the feast day of St. John, the, the gospel writer. Now, curiously, John was actually the only original disciple not to be martyred, to be killed, in fact, he lived to be a very, to a very old age. But he did suffer under the persecutions of the Roman emperor Domitian. It is said that John was plunged into a pot of boiling oil in Rome, but somehow miraculously lived through it, which of course infuriated the emperor. And so John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos for the rest of his life, where he wrote some of his letters, and of course the book of Revelation comes from that time. And today, we acknowledge the third feast day of this week, which is the Feast of the Holy Innocents, those children who were killed in Bethlehem by King Herod. And I want us to think about this for a moment, this juxtaposition of our holiday celebrations all last week, and these church celebrations that occurred during the same week. Celebrations that are not so much joyful as they are solemn, however. And I have to admit, I always find it a bit confusing each year to read and, and remember these stories of martyrdom and suffering and murder that occur on the first three days right after Christmas. I mean, December 25th, we're celebrating the, the birth of Jesus with angels and trumpets in the air and and then the next day on the 26th, the killing of St. Stephen, the 27th, the punishment and exile of John, and the 28th, which is actually the feast day of the Holy Innocents, the, the murder of these little children in Bethlehem. And I actually thought about skipping all this this year and perhaps focusing on maybe just delivering some sort of feel-good New Year's message. Huh? New Year's Eve it is today. But as I looked back over this past year and thought about the meaning of Christmas and the birth of Jesus and these stories that immediately follow, I wondered if we, or I, sometimes miss the real meaning of Christmas and all that goes with it. 
And I wonder if we told people what really is in the Christmas story, which includes these three stories of the feast days, would people still want to celebrate it the way we do? I mean, each year I read all manner of stories about how the story of Christmas is really about perhaps an unwed mother being visited by an angel and giving birth to a child in a barn and how with her husband Joseph, whom we were never really told when they got married, they did at some point, but how they are, are together at the birth of Jesus and, and how regardless of how any of our nativity sets look, this new family spends quite a bit of time in Bethlehem where they are eventually visited by the three wise men, some foreign astrologers who had noticed something peculiar in the sky, and how when they travel and go to see what might be causing this astrological phenomenon, they meet King Herod. And they tell King Herod, hey, we think that a new king of the Jews has been born. And we're told how Herod flies into a rage and, and kills all the baby boys in Bethlehem, two years old and younger. So about two years must have gone by, right? But Jesus is saved from this because another angel comes to Joseph in a dream and tells him to take his new family and, and flee down to Egypt as refugees to escape the murderous regime of King Herod. You know, when you truly read the Christmas story for what it really is, how it's really presented to us, it can, see, it can seem a little at odds with our neatly compiled and somewhat sanitized versions. I mean, the story as presented to us is really nothing like the Christmas Eve tales we tell when the, when the birth and the angels and the shepherds and the, three, and the three wise men and the ox and the donkey and the little drummer boy all appear around some <laughs> glowing manger all on the same night. I mean, it's wonderful Christmas Eve stuff. Keep telling it, but it's not really how it happens. And then, my goodness, and then if you add into that these stories of martyrdom and exile and murder of little children, Christmas can become a little scary. Well, as I thought about all of this this past week, I remembered how differently the Christmas story is told in other parts of the world, not the United States version. In particular, the Middle East, where these events actually took place. When I was in seminary, my, cl my class took a trip to Israel and Palestine, and during the Christmas season. And so we got to experience the, the Christmas story in the very location that it all happened. And with direct, di direct descendants of people who were actually there 2,000 years ago. In fact, our home base for this trip, where our hotel was, was, was in Bethlehem. And we went to a little side village in Bethlehem that, called Beit Sahor, which translates as Town of the Shepherds, Beit Town Sahur Shepherds. And lo and behold, at Beit Sahur is the same town, the same hill, where sheep still grazed and shepherds still watched over them, just as those shepherds were doing on the night of Jesus' birth. Still there. Oh, you're okay, Khalil. <laughs> and when you talk to the people who live there, which, by the way, you know, Bethlehem is actually still 80% Christian. Not at all the hotbed of radical Islam that the modern state of Israel and a lot of the world media would have us believe. But when you actually talk to the people who, who are still living there and whose families have been there since the birth of Jesus and before and who have been Christians since that time, when you talk to them about the Christmas story they always include the murder of the little children of, of Bethlehem. It's their town. And the escape of Mary and Jesus and Joseph down to Egypt as refugees. It, it happened in their town. For them, it's, this is integral to the Christmas story. It's not left out. But this is simply the way it happened. And because of the way the th that things are still in the Holy Land today, the story of a savior born in somewhat squalid conditions to a young mother and father 
who had to struggle to stay alive and raise their new son and flee from a murderous tyrant and travel across borders, all the while trying to maintain their dedication to God and this new baby they've been given, Jesus. For the people who live in in Bethlehem today, this story of joy around the birth of a Savior and the struggle of everyday life is real. It still happens. They don't have to go through all the mental machinations that that we sometimes have to try to do to, to try to understand this part of the story because it's still like that today. And so I decided this week that I did not want to skip these somewhat strange stories of suffering and murder so close to Christmas. And that I did not want to gloss over the hard reality we know as life as we prepare to celebrate the dawn of a new year. And as I myself try to understand all these things and and try to gather some perspective in my own mind about about the great dichotomy of life in which there is so much joy and beauty occupying the same world as so much ugliness and hatred. You know, when I look backward and forward and, and try to understand what all these stories mean and, and, you know, how can these stories perhaps help us in our lives today? That's the point. When I sit with the Christmas story in its entirety... I come to understand that when Jesus was born and laid in a manger for the first time, it was against all odds that that would happen. And the odds only got worse as time went on. And so this year, my friends, instead of thinking to ourselves or, or maybe even complaining out loud, that's, that's not the Christmas story I really want to hear, Pastor John. <clears throat> Let's hear it. And let us use it for what it it can be, which is an actual blueprint of how we might lead our lives. I mean, how many people have ever thought of the Christmas story that way, as a blueprint of how we might live? And I confess I never have. It's always a little baby Jesus story. But it really is. It really can be that blueprint. For the story of God's incarnation... You know, Emmanuel, God with us, in the person and baby of Jesus, is a story for us all. And just as Mary and Joseph had to o- overcome some pretty unique circumstances in their lives, they rose to the responsibility of caring for the one God had, had given them to watch over. And just as Stephen was chosen to care for the the growing community of those early Christians. He rose to the occasion and remained steadfast in his belief, even to the point of being stoned to death. That's a horrible way to die. And just as John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, suffered horribly in life under Roman persecutions, he stayed true to his Savior. First, by caring for Mary... Jesus' mother, as Jesus asked him to do from the cross. And then, by encouraging the spread of the early Christian movement through, through all of his writings, Gospels and letters and Revelation, and who knows what else he might have written. And even the little children of Bethlehem, who did absolutely nothing to deserve their fate. We can even honor them this day and their grieving parents and families. As the innocents who were killed by a tyrant seeking to destroy the grace that God had borne into the world. You know, whenever I read the story of these young victims of King Herod, the picture in my mind now goes to, remember that picture of the young boy in Syria last year sitting in the back of an ambulance? covered in dust and debris and half his face covered in blood as as he had just been pulled out of a bombed out building and a completely blank stare on his face. That's what I picture now when I hear these holy innocents. I mean, what did he ever do to deserve that? 
You know, because when Jesus was born into our world, the world did not suddenly change and all hardship and all suffering suddenly disappear. Bad people, evil intentions, and murderous tyrants still exist. What did change was our, our ability to endure these things and to rise to the occasion to try to change them. So although the stories we encounter this week are hard, there is good news in all of this. And that is that in the midst of all the bad news of human suffering and needless death and loss and comes the news that God loves us. That God has come to us. And that God is in the midst of it all with us. We're not alone. When terrible things happen, God's there. When we are sad and frightened, God's there. When all seems overwhelming, God's there. The story of Christmas is the story of God loving us so much that God joins us in our day-to-day -day lives. The story of Christmas is a story about a family struggling to make it and relying on God to help them. The story of Christmas is a story about people inviting God into their lives and their lives forever being changed thereafter. And the story of Christmas is a story about us finding our way in the world to stand up for the innocent, to heal the brokenhearted, to bind the wounds of the injured, and to frustrate evil so that God's reign of justice and love will remain real in our hearts even as we might go home early and take down our trees and put away our decorations for another year. So my friends, there is good news in the Christmas story. My prayer for you is that you find it and keep it alive in your hearts for the remaining hours of this year and all of next. Amen. Amen. Will you pray with me, please? God of wisdom and truth, at the beginning of this new year, we look back and forward to the year that has passed. We, in, in the year that has passed, we experienced both joy and sorrow, and there were times we felt blessed and sometimes challenged. Some things went by much too fast. Other things lingered way too long. But here in this place, this morning, we are reminded that you are present with us through it all, that we are never alone, and that nothing can ever separate us from your love. So at the dawn of the beginning of this new year, we will pause in silence to reflect on the months that have passed, remembering from this past all that we are most thankful for, the moments we were happiest and, and felt most alive and, and the times we both gave and received the most love. And we are grateful, God, that you were present with us during those times. And God, we're grateful, too, that you were present in those times when we did not feel happy, alive, and loved. Gracious God, at the beginning of this new year, we are confident that you will be with us still in this world that is both messy and challenging, a world of pain and doubt and fear, injustice, a world full of human failings. Yet God, you are with us always. So give us grace and give us courage to live faithfully, reminding us always of the promise of your kingdom come as it emerges around us and through us this day.
Christ's name we pray. Amen. My friends, now let us take that minute of silence to reflect upon all we have heard this morning. Amen. 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 Thank you. And please be seated, everyone. <clears throat> and join me, please, in our prayer of confession and assurance of illumination. Jesus came into somewhat of a different world, yet not so different from ours after all. Wars and occupations still exist, tyrants still rule and children still need protection from their guardians. Let us ask God for hope and courage to be his protectors in this new year. <clears throat> and now let us proclaim together our need for God's hope and strength in our lives. Lord God, help us to praise you by living in harmony and peace. Where these things are absent, 
Strengthen us to care for your children, no matter who they may be. Set us free from fear to walk in your holy name. Well, my friends, renewed and made whole, we see the path that God has prepared for us, the way of peace, the way of hope, the way of grace, the way of service. And thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and blessed be the God of all creation. And all creation God. God is with you. And also with you. So open your hearts. We open them up to God. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. When we come together and eat this bread and drink from this cup, we remember Christ's death and resurrection. In that remembrance, let us proclaim again what is the mysterious and miraculous truth of our faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ is here, and Christ shall come again. Hallelujah. And now let us all pray together in the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> On the night that Jesus was betrayed by one of his own friends, he was sharing a meal with his disciples, and during that meal he took what was an ordinary piece of bread, and he raised it, blessed it, broke it, and gave it. Gave it to each and every person there with him telling each and every one of them to take and eat. For this now is my body, soon to be given up for you. Later on, during that same meal, Jesus took an ordinary cup of wine, raising it and blessing it. And then he passed the cup. And he told each and every person to take and drink from, from this cup. For this now is the cup of the new covenant soon to be sealed in the shedding of my blood for you and the forgiveness of sin for all people across all time. And he told them every time that you do this, every time that you share in this meal together, remember me. Would you pray with me, please? Holy God, we proclaim that we do remember. And because of that, we ask that you bless us this day by turning these simple elements of your creation, bread and grape, into our spiritual nourishment once more, so that we may be filled with a sense of your grace and mercy and love, that we then may go out into this hungry and hurting world and share with others. We ask for this as in all things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, my friends, each and every week we, re we remind ourselves that here at St. Jude's, as in every single metropolitan community church around the entire world, we celebrate an open communion table, which means that you do not need to be a member of this church or any church anywhere to come and receive these gifts now blessed by God for all of God's people. We simply and humbly ask that you do come and come just as you are. Come just as you are, hear the Spirit call, come just as you are, come and see, come receive. Come and live
please do come receive these gifts of God for all of God's people.
and loving God, once more we say thank you for inviting us into your presence this morning and blessing us anew this day, to which we all can say thank you and amen, amen. (coughs) And now if you would help me sing our closing song, we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 6 of hymn number 265, 1, 2, and 6. My friends, as you leave this holy place for what is probably the last time this year, go out into the world knowing that you are loved and share that love with some of me you meet today and all of next year. Amen. Amen. Amen.